Hello, welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for Stooge for a Mouse and with me today is my fellow Stooge, Matt Hunter. Say hi. Sweetenly. <laughs> well, not that kind of Stooge, but hey, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe I should review the Three Stooges one of these days, but... Who knows, I've got plenty of cartoons to get through, including this one. So it's Stooge for a Mouse, released on the 21st of October 1950. It had a blue ribbon reissue sometime in 58. It's the 602nd in the series, and it's directed by Frizz Freeling. Now, as for availability, this one's very interesting, because I believe it came from not just HBO Max, but the Latin version of HBO Max. Is that correct, Matt? I think so. This was somebody captured it from HBO Max Latin America. They apparently have a different selection of cartoons than we do in America. So there you go. It's another thing, Warners, if you're watching it, release these on disc, please. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> put them on disc, please. Thank you. As for this cartoon, because yeah, I can't show you the full cartoon here due to YouTube, but all that happens is you've got Sylvester and his bulldog friend. What's the friend's name in this cartoon? Because it's not Hector. Well, he, he's Mike in this one. Mike. It's the same character. It's Hector. It's the same bulldog we've seen paired with Sylvester in the Freeling cartoons. It's just he's, I guess they hadn't really decided on a formal name, but it's Mike. So Sylvester and Mike, they're good friends. And you've got this mouse, which doesn't have a name, trying to steal some cheese. So his plan is to turn... Sylvester and Mike against each other to amusing results. One bit of trivia for this cartoon, and it's it's an interesting one, because according to the Cartoon Logic podcast done by Thad Komorowski, this short was actually written by Frizz Freeling. Now, there's no writing credits on the cartoon, so that definitely lends uh, support to that um, bit of information as well. But as I understand it, Frizz was between writers, because he did this one and did one other one, and then he had a writer again. So that, that, right. was, that was interesting. Well, he'd been working with Ted Pierce, and then Warren Foster came along. So I don't know the whole story behind that. That would be something to ask Thad, because he would know more than I would on that. But, you know, if he says Frizz Freeling wrote this cartoon, I believe him. And I'll tell you why. Because the same plot was used again several years later for a Bugs Bunny and Rocky and Muggsy cartoon. And generally, if you saw the same plot again in a Freeling cartoon, it was his idea to do it. So <laughs> I think, yeah, definitely, Frizz wrote this. His timing is all over it, too. I mean, just the w once it gets going, you get the particularly the boxing glove scene. When that happens, that is pure Frizz Freeling. Oh, yeah, the timing. And, and even just the little things like the mouse tiptoeing from the start, just... Pure frizz. Pure, like, you watch this cartoon, even if you didn't see the production card in the beginning and, and all that, not, you would know this is a frizz cartoon. Just for the, oh, yeah. the, 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 the you know, the, the timing and, and all that sort of stuff. But this also is interesting with, with Frizz writing this one because a lot of the time I've found some directors, especially Chuck Jones, I'm going to use him as an example here, where they do great work with other writers. So in Chuck Jones's case, he does great work with Mark Maltese and, of course, Ted Pierce prior but later on once Mike Maltese left for Hanna-Barbera you find that Chuck works with other writers but also he writes him himself and those cartoons seem to be weaker he definitely needed Pierce and Maltese because yep. you know he worked with some others there was a guy named John Dunn for yep. example who Frizz Freeling actually really worked well with and loved and took with him when they formed to Patty Freeling wrote a bunch of great Pink Panther cartoons. He was a funny guy, but it, with Chuck Jones, it didn't work out so well with that guy. And Chuck by himself was great writing his own Roadrunner cartoons and that kind of stuff. But when he wrote Bugs Bunny, for example, he tended to get too talky. Wordy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. Here, yeah. hurry. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks for reminding me. I have to do that one eventually. Thanks. But, <laughs> but in any case, with Frizz, this just shows that he's actually quite good at, at writing his own stuff. I mean, I would imagine it's not the some sort of thing he would have wanted to do all the time because as a director, you have so many tasks. You know, why would you want to have that extra task on top of everything? But this shows that he was definitely more than capable of doing it himself. And while this cartoon isn't, you know, groundbreaking or anything... It's really, really funny. Can we take a minute and talk about what a troll this little mouse is? Oh, yes. And this was a character that Frizz used in the 50s, and he wasn't ever named, but he's definitely appeared before, and he appears after this. He's a, a Holly Pratt design. He's just kind of a generic mouse. This mouse went up against Bugs Bunny. 
in a cartoon, in one of the greatest Bugs Bunny cartoons, Rhapsody Rabbit. He's the mouse in the piano. And then this same mouse harasses Sylvester again in Canned Feud, where he's got the can opener and Sylvester has tons of canned food, but no can opener. So this little mouse just likes to show up and torture people, particularly Sylvester. I don't know what his name is. I don't know the story behind that. I just know that He's appeared multiple times, and he's a troll. Exactly, and, and thankfully at the end, he does get his uh, comeuppance, because let's For face once, it, yeah. <laughs> look, yeah. Let's, let's face it, this, this pairing of the dog and Sylvester, I thought it was quite charming, you know, I just love the way that they speak to each other in this, it's just, yeah. it's, so, it's so wholesome, it's nice to see something more on the wholesome <laughs> side, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, you know, and this is the right way of doing it. I mean, speaking of Chuck Jones, you know, he tried to go wholesome with sniffles and that in the early stuff, but the, this is wholesome to me as far as Looney Tunes goes. Just, right. Well, and, until they start, you know, punching each other across the room, you know, mm. until the dog starts just, you know, grabbing Sylvester by the neck and throttling him. I remember there was a commercial for Looney Tunes on Nickelodeon when I was a kid and part of the, you know, one of the little bumpers that came between the shorts they would show that little scene with with the dog you know slapping sylvester nickelodeon ran this one a lot and they they ran bugsy and mugsy a lot too so i remember seeing the contrast between the two but yet they were kind of the same idea anyway this cartoon is funny i i don't know that it's that groundbreaking but it's funny i'll just give it exactly right and i did actually notice one minor um animation error and this is again big deal but it it was just something i noticed and it's the color of those chains that uh, the dog just happens to have with him when he's like when he chains up uh, sylvester in that one scene it starts off in one part gray and then like for a split second and then it turns gold which is what the actual color should have been i just thought oh okay that's a weird little little error you know i guess freeze was putting too much too much effort on his uh, timing to notice that but eh, again who cares i just thought it was interesting Another thing I notice about this restored version is the glow of the fireplace. That's a really nice touch. Yes, I love thy neighbor. And again, it's wholesome. It's nice, you know. It's a nice little, yeah, yeah. you know, it's like a warm and fuzzy opening. And you know, and of course, yeah. it, it ended up turning into, into Looney Tunes. So, ter- so it goes from Disney to Looney Tunes. That's, that's what I, yeah. I think of this cartoon. So, yeah. as far as rating goes, you know, this one gives me a nice solid eight out of ten. Nothing groundbreaking, but Honestly, I could think of worse cartoons than this. This one's just, hey, if it's on, I'll watch it. This is probably a a 7.5 or 8 for me. I'll give it an 8 just to be generous. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, not not all of these are going to warrant, I guess, uh, half an hour review discussions like Boobs in the Woods. You know, Manny Cruz, if you're watching, Uh. you know, that's me wagging my finger at you. But... (laughs) But in any case, we'll wrap it up here. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, take care.